he was um, the president of the international division of AIG. Um, so, you know, he did a lot of business travel. He did a lot. I mean, he was in insurance. So, um, obviously, numbers and, um, you know, strategizing and, and marketing and all that stuff was really important, um, which is ironic because one of the first signs, you know, years later that we picked up on that maybe something was wrong cognitively was he was making really bad financial decisions, really bad business decisions. But he would, you know, give money to anyone who solicited him. So, you know, WTBW, you know, any kind of nonprofit that asked for money. So he was like probably giving money to every single <laughs> disease out there, you know, every single, you know, political party and whatnot, um, which again caused him to <laughs> lose probably a great deal of money. I was actually living in the city at that point, so I think it was shortly thereafter I moved up to Evanston to be closer to him. Daily visits turned into twice a day visits, turned into three times a day visits, turned into having a caregiver in the mornings and then me coming over in the afternoon and in the evenings. Um, and that lasted for about a year and a half and then it was just too much work and he uh, wasn't safe to be living at home by himself anymore. So um, one of the hardest things I had ever done up to that point was uh, move him out of his apartment and um, it was very difficult. But again, I was very active and I was there, you know, many times a week and was able to help him in a lot of other ways. Um, on Chris New Year's Day of 2010, uh, I went to visit him and he uh, was non-responsive in bed and they called the nurse and uh, they couldn't wake him up so we called 911 and um, they took him to the ER. They thought that maybe he had had a, a series of small strokes. Um, so we spent six days in the hospital. And um, on the sixth day, the doctor said we should call hospice. So the hospice team came in, Midwest Hospice, and I met with them for a number of hours. And, um, you know, the hospice diagnosis is, you know, expected to live less than six months. He went on to be on hospice for more than two and a half years. About two weeks before, Julie, the hospice nurse, was saying, you know, we're noticing some changes. We're noticing some change in vitals. He's starting to slow down. Um, you know, he's eating less and less. Um, I think we're we're looking at a, at, a, at a possible end here. So I started, you know, talking to people at work about, you know, can I take a leave of absence? How does this work out? And um, so I spent about uh, it was six days from when they, you know, said he was actively transitioning. Um, and I would spend anywhere from, you know, six hours to 12 hours, literally next to him, just sort of, you know, holding his arm and whatnot. And he just, um, you could tell he was ready to go. He, you know, he just came, became back to that really peaceful state. And there was, we could have, there was no way, you know, way to know when he was going to go. and. They said, maybe you need to leave, you know, and we said our, we said our goodbyes and it was like, it was the hardest thing ever. 12.45, they called and they said, you know, he, they called and they just, they just, I said hello and they said, yeah, I said, okay, we're on our way. Um, it was about, you know, we had been gone half hour basically. Um... I have an incredible uh, support network, um, friends and colleagues and, and peers and whatnot. Uh, and I, I feel that I'm, you know, sort of living his legacy in a way, you know, taking our experiences and, and growing from it and, and helping other people in a way. And if, you know, I can't be with him in person anymore, this is what I have to do. I have to go out and help people from our story. And it's, it's meaningful.